Hello everyone and welcome. Thanks for joining us today. It's fantastic to see alumni registered from across the world and I hope we're able to provide you with some really interesting and thought-provoking content. The Institute for Manufacturing is part of the University of Cambridge Department of Engineering. We bring together expertise across management, technology and policy to address a range of manufacturing issues. We have close relationships and links with organisations from across industry, government and universities. We're delighted to have Tim Minchell as our speaker today. Tim is the John C. Taylor Professor of Innovation and Head of the Institute for Manufacturing. So first, a little bit of housekeeping. Please ask any questions using the Q&A panel. Tim will answer these questions at the end. For anything else, if you're having technical issues, please use the chat functionality and we'll do our best to help. Just a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand. So now I am going to hand over to Tim. Kate, thank you very much for that and uh, good afternoon or uh, good morning or good evening wherever you are in the world to everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, we're really excited to be able to to give this talk today um there's been some amazing things happening across the university and across the engineering department and across the institute and across our whole alumni network but so i'm going to try today just to do really one thing which is just to illustrate one uh, bundle of projects that have been underway during covid and this is not in any way to claim that these were the most important projects or the whatever these are just projects that were undertaken during covid to illustrate something quite extraordinary about um, how uh, activities linked to different bits of cambridge have been able to respond to support uh, the nhs during a particular time of need so what i'm going to do is in the next sort of 20 25 minutes ish is to cover four things and then as kate says there'll be time for q a at the end and so first of all I'm going to try and um, position this and to remind us of the situation we were in back in March and April when a lot of these projects kicked off. Although recent news reminds us that the, we're very much not through this yet. I'll then go on to just uh, explain how we've grouped these three types of engineering responses that we observed um, over the last few months, um, some of which you'll look at and and think yeah we expect engineers to do things like that but some other things that are perhaps a little bit different that again were the application of, of, of uh, good engineering principles good engineering tools and techniques to address particular problems from this i'm then going to try and just extract some very uh, 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 lightweight uh, uh, simple lessons we learned from this which are actually i feel quite important to document now and i'll talk a little bit more about why we're documenting them later on and finally, just to make this point that this is not a, a reflection on something that is finished, this is about how do we continue to um, uh, apply engineering content and engineering expertise and engineering know-how to address healthcare system challenges. So first of all, context. Um, so I had to remind myself of where we were back in February, March, April. And the way I did that was by going back and looking at um, some headlines from websites and news stories and all sorts. And it was, it, it was quite clear that perhaps in the UK, we were a bit slow to be uh, responding to the, the scale of this particular challenge. And um, there was a, perhaps a feeling that for some countries, perhaps the UK included, that it was, it was clearly very serious, but it was happening somewhere far away and it, 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 we couldn't relate to it. And then very quickly we saw it was reaching us very quickly. It was affecting us. It was going to have an impact on us uh, as a society, as an economy and us as individuals. And then the scale of it, not just that it would affect us, but this pandemic nature uh, caused a complete shift in thinking very, very rapidly as we recall. And then this famous picture were, appeared everywhere this idea that uh, we, people just didn't quite get it where they hear messages about, well, people are asymptomatic or the symptoms are very mild, so why does it matter? And then this chart with all its flaws was put out and became almost a meme that, that that's something we could many people could relate to. It said, look, 
this is about ensuring the healthcare system survives through this and that um, uh, widening, flattening the curve um, message was pushed out very widely. And I think for a lot of people that helped, notwithstanding it did have some flaws associated with it. And then we started to see in the UK what was happening uh, nearby across Europe and not just that it was hitting uh, the healthcare system in a way that was uh, challenging under normal circumstances, but it was actually shooting things up dramatically. So we saw photos like this of hospitals being set up in car parks. And again, this sense of, hang on, this is, this is very, very worrying. We don't know how to deal with this, or do we know how to deal with this? And then there was a knock-on effect. People saying, well, okay, if the healthcare system struggles with this because there are more people getting it, that's one thing. But of course, there's all the knock-on effects. If, if those who are working in the healthcare system also get taken out of action due to the virus, that's going to have a, a, um, a, a multiplying effect as well. How can we work out what's going on there? And then bring it down to very um, tangible, physical things. Uh, when it was clear that under the, the early uh, period of COVID, a huge number of people were going fairly rapidly with, if they suffered from the severe symptoms, uh, the severe consequences of, of having the virus and associated uh, conditions, they, needed to be, they were put under ventilators quite quickly. Now we see less of that happening today, but at the time, the predictions were we were going to need in the UK a substantial increase in the number of, of ventilating devices that were available. And they looked uh, at what was available and found there was much, uh, uh, very few, far less than was, was needed were available. And then there was also the issue that we saw uh, all over the place around PPE and this, this problem of supply and demand that maybe there was enough but it wasn't in the right places and the fact that more people were using it, all sorts of complicated issues to do with this um, the local and regional and national and international impact of COVID. To this point that it was initially recognized as being a big thing, it affected, it moved very swiftly around the world, the messaging around it needed to be changed to make it clear what we were trying to do. The consequences of not doing something became clear and a whole series of predictions of what might happen with very wide error bars um, were, became clear to people. And so because of the width of these error bars, things had to happen quickly to say, well, those are, that top of that error bar there is the worst case scenario. It might be much, much less than that, but we don't know. So we have to prepare for worst case. So, Lots of things happened in all sorts of areas of, of the healthcare system, across society, across different areas of the economy. I'm not going to talk about all of those. I'm just going to extract three particular um, examples of types of projects that colleagues here were involved in to address some of the many, many challenges that arose uh, very quickly. So the three broad categories can be fit into sort of two very simple dimensions. One was things that were done here in Cambridge locally to support Cambridge University Hospitals Trust, the Royal Papworth Hospital Trust and primary healthcare and the wider community. So things that were happening outside uh, within a few miles of where, we, where I am at the moment. Secondly, there were things that were more generic that could be applied anywhere um, uh, whether in the UK or internationally, it didn't matter. These were solutions to global problems. And within these two categories, three sorts of projects. So there was a series of projects relating to hospital logistics. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. Secondly, there were a, a series of initiatives linked to policies to address particular COVID challenges. And thirdly, perhaps what you'd expect engineers to be doing, the actual uh, rapid development of physical products to fill particular gaps in provision as the pandemic uh, worked its course. So those are the three types of projects we, uh, we can bundle together. First of all, the hospital logistics. So again, um, working with uh, absolutely outstanding colleagues at Cambridge University's Hospitals Trust, there are a series of, of things identified where engineering uh, tools and techniques could be used to support the great work that was being done there already and support the uh, ability to cope with a very uncertain and rapidly changing future. And so on the policy side, this was more about seeing how other governments in one sense were responding to COVID. So we didn't make the same mistakes. We could learn from what was happening elsewhere and deploy that nationally, but also looking at some of the global policy issues such as the management of IP under these circumstances. Again, more on that later. But a big thing we were looking at there also was 
capturing knowledge on what was going on so that policymakers, when they need to access data, they need to access experience, they need to access what worked, we have that knowledge available to pass on to them in one place. And then the physical products. So there were some things that were very much targeted at, initially targeted at local needs or were addressing local requirements. So either support for particular things that were needed in uh, local hospitals or the local healthcare system. So making sure that sufficient PPE was available to those who needed it, when they needed it, where they needed it. And then there were physical products that were not particularly targeted locally that were for use uh, globally or in specific uh, situations overseas. And again, I'll talk more about those later. So these are the three bundles of projects that we, uh, we as IFM, we as engineering department were involved in. And as I say, there were many other projects that I'm not covering here. These are for illustration purposes only. So if we just look at hospital logistics, and I'll do each one of these boxes one at a time. Um, we saw something rather wonderful happen. So when it became clear that the error bars, the, the, predict, the range of predicted outcomes of the, the initial surge um, were very wide, um, we were given the chance to talk to some colleagues at Addenbrooke's in particular, Addenbrooke's Hospital. Uh, I name check two key people here. One in uh, the, so the smaller pictures on the left there on the, in the middle row, that's Ewan Cameron. And uh, on the right there, that's Dan Northam Jones. And they're two senior guys from Addenbrooke's or specifically Cambridge University Hospitals Trust, who through other connections that were made, and thanks to Florian Urmetzer as well, who's in that middle row too, started a conversation uh, about what could be done. And so the outdoor picture there of the socially distanced younger people, that are some of our um, MPhil graduate students who volunteered to get involved in supporting whatever the hospital needed. And I'll talk about what they did in a second. And then on the left-hand side again, those the, the, the faces there, this was led by one of our colleagues, Duncan McFarlane, who recognised there were many things we could do to help the hospital. We needed to work out what the hospital most needed and to make sure that we, we were coordinated in our response. So we weren't acting as a, an annoyance by just trying to be helpful and just bumping into lots of things. So Duncan played a key role in coordinating all of this, along with uh, bottom row, left to right, Ajit Palakad, Tom Ridgman and Jag Sry. And so that was a team who came together to try and support uh, particular initiatives at Addenbrooke's Hospital. And from those six projects there, I'll just pick three. And if you'd like to know more detail about these three projects, a separate webinar was run by the graduate students who are involved in that, and that uh, is available on demand, as well as a specific webinar just on the um, uh, patient uh, flow and simulation activities, as, again, as a separate webinar. So I'm going to give you a very uh, high level, simple view of what went on there. So one issue that emerged during the, the uh, rapid rise up the curve of cases was the way the NHS is able to share information about experiences in different hospitals is really impressive. They can, they can spot when one hospital or one trust has a problem, that information is passed on very quickly to others so they can address this issue. A specific issue here was around supply of oxygen. So we mentioned earlier about ventilators. When well, it became clear from the um, uh, uh, development of clinical responses to the very extreme uh, cases of COVID that were hitting Italy, that actually the use of slightly different technologies could prevent people needing to go on to be a to be fully uh, uh, onto a ventilator. We have to be sedated. It's 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 you know it, it's a very severe process. Once you're onto that ventilator, it's it's a complex process to manage it. But if there are simpler things that could be done in advance to ensure that people didn't need to go onto ventilators, specifically the use of uh, continuous pressure uh, masks where you pump oxygen through a mask, not ramming it down the throat through a tube, but it's put into a mask. The issue with that is it, it can be very effective, but it needs a lot of oxygen. So what happened, one of the healthcare trusts reported over, I believe it was a weekend, uh, I won't name the trust, I think it was Watford, but I'll be corrected on this, I'm sure. They reported that they were concerned that they might run out of oxygen and once that message got out to others they then said right if we are going to be using way more oxygen than we normally do if so many more hospital beds with the normal oxygen tap next to them if many many more of them than normal are needed can we cope with that will the system collapse at this point so again 
in this case, case uh, Karl Magnus, uh, Moritz and Oliver got together and said, right, what can we do to understand what the situation is and have a structured approach for looking at what was there and as they put here in these very helpful slides they provided me with, questioning the obvious, assume nothing, going, can we really be sure we know exactly what's going on with the supply of oxygen in this particular hospital? And secondly, to then, okay, let's look precisely at what is going on, bearing in mind we don't know, if we haven't got good data, how we know how many patients we could be treating. Okay, we'll go through the whole process to work out where bottlenecks might be so that the true data can be revealed. And sure enough, by then capturing this data and making it visible, available electronically, to those who need that information, this provided a really useful tool for colleagues at Anbrooks. So that was one project looking at a particularly complex and messy situation and working out what the, the, the real issue was and providing reliable data on that to anybody who needed it. A second project I'm just going to cover briefly was back in the early days, we, we've got in, we're in a different world for testing at the moment, but back in April uh, and March uh, around that time, key thing was testing of the hospital staff and NHS staff. So again, that was, it was a smaller scale activity, but still needed to happen very, very rapidly. So again, to ensure that there were no bottlenecks, to make sure that the tests could be deployed, um, again, students going in there, so David, Jack and Nisha, looking at this idea of how do you ensure a reliable um, and a flexible and appropriate testing regime to ensure that all the NHS staff who need testing get it, and that prioritiz prioritization issues can be dealt with um, as smoothly as possible. So the first thing was literally the layout of how testing is done to make sure that had been optimised, again applying good industrial engineering principles. Then to say but there are certain bits of kit that are needed, if we can start to automate some of these bits of the process, you can rapidly, uh, sorry, dramatically increase um, throughput. And then also making sure there was a system for booking and automating what was going on so that uh, there wasn't there wouldn't be backlogs and there wouldn't be crises every time there was an urgent series of tests that needed to be carried out. So again, the application of good industrial engineering principles, understanding what the root cause of the problem is, and working through the solution that is appropriate for that environment, using the minimum resources without doing anything to interrupt the process as it stood. And the third and final one I want to touch on under this hospital logistics one is one done by George Kaya, supervised by Ajit Palikad, which was um, simulations and scenarios looking at what's going to be happening so there was this is in the middle of the first peak how can things be planned for what might happen next given there are so many uncertainties and so again developed uh, scenarios looked at then what would be needed in each of those scenarios in terms of equipment and uh, staff availability and all sorts of things that are needed to make sure the hospital can function under very very different scenarios so again capturing what the situation is now using the appropriate tool to come up with simulations that allowed a clearer understanding of how to manage this through uncertainty, to look at ways in which um, surges in demand can be managed, and making sure this information is available to those who need it at the right time in the right way to support decision making. There's no point just having lots of data if it doesn't actually, if it isn't made available in a manner that supports those who need to make decisions. So again, that's three projects looking at hospital logistics where these uh, engineering uh, graduate students being supervised by uh, some academic colleagues were able to work on these specific problems in partnership with the NHS colleagues to do what was needed for the NHS colleagues. That was the key, key issue. So I'm now going to shift over to look at some of these policies. Um, and again, just to, uh, sorry, the policy initiatives, things that were done um, that had uh, kind of a global reach to them where again good systems engineering approach is saying it's a very messy situation and complex fast moving situation we need to capture what's going on and make it available to those who need it and i'll just talk about a couple of examples from this so first of all colleagues um owen jennifer carlos and michele got were asked by uh, the department for um uh, business energy industrial strategy to say look manufacturing is clearly going to be under immense pressure during this pandemic. I wanted to look at three particular issues to do with manufacturing policies that were being implemented rapidly around the world from which the UK could learn and respond. Number one was to do with we need to ensure the survival of the manufacturing sector. It is so vital to our economy. If things start to happen that actually break that, 
we're going to be in huge trouble. So survival of the manufacturing sector. Secondly, there was then the use of manufacturing capabilities to address urgent needs. So the whole discussion around repurposing and for those who've seen many of these activities around the world, for example, in the UK, there was the UK ventilator challenge, getting you know, Formula One teams and um, gas turbine companies and aircraft companies making ventilators was an example of taking manufacturing capability and repurposing it um, to allow um, uh, the healthcare system to get some of the equipment it needed. And then thirdly, supporting manufacturing to come out from this situation and hence for the UK economy to come out of this situation stronger by improving the resilience of what was going on. A lot of discussion around long supply chains and problems we faced with um, uh, inability to access certain things. And also the ability to say, well, can we, can we do this repurposing on a more strategic as opposed to ad hoc basis? So again, policy response is engineers looking at a messy situation and working out what the key issues are and presenting that data in a usable format, not just in the form of reports to um, senior civil servants, but also directly inputting to select committees. So here's Carlos Lopez Gomez giving evidence to one of the parliamentary committees. We also saw an un uh, these wider initiatives about global supply chains and just picking out one example from our colleague Jag Sry, who looked at the issues around supply chain for food and the impact of COVID or any pandemic on how we get our food. And so some very useful, specific things for, for uh, individual sectors were developed as well. Again, engineers looking at big, messy situations and extracting what's important to help make better decisions. Um, another example was back at the start of all of this, there were clearly lots of ideas out there of things that could solve COVID challenges. And um, it was predicted that one of the barriers to some of these ideas being used would be IP and people either intentionally or unintentionally stopping ideas being used because of IP concerns. And our colleague Frank Titzer, working with three other colleagues, so Prathiba, Leo and Jenny, uh, came up this sort of thought piece to begin with, just going, hang on, how can we, how can we sure this doesn't happen? What can we do to prevent this? Now, Frank and colleague could have just stopped at that point going, well, yeah, there's a question, someone should answer that. He and his colleagues didn't. They went forward and said, right, let's actually work out what all the issues are around this and really look at the, what we know about IP and how IP can be managed to make sure that we do understand what the barriers are and how they can be overcome. But not only that, they also got uh, actively involved in the open COVID pledge, which was this idea that would rapidly short circuit many of the normal routes to say, this is the way, these are the ways in which companies or any organization can make their IP available for COVID related purposes. So you commit to this pledge to do that so that ideas don't, that could be really valuable for addressing COVID challenges don't sit on the shelves. So a nice example of spotting something, building on prior research, working out what the problem really is, and then contributing to the solution. So that's the first two bits done. The third and final bit is around physical products. And you'll be relieved to hear that um, for some of these bits here, I've actually got a video to play rather than me talking too much. So I'll just give you a, a couple of examples of some of these uh, things that were developed around a physical product addressing a particular need to respond to COVID challenges. So one of them was PPE. Now, two, three, multiple ways of dealing with that. One was for the government just to buy more and just get more. But if, there isn't, if it's a pandemic, there's just not enough in the world. Secondly, to make more, that takes a little while to sort that out. But then there were also lots of people who wanted to donate PPE. But how do you donate into the NHS? So what happened is this. So I'll show you, if I may, a short video that appeared, uh, was made by the university and appeared on a few news channels about this pop-up PPE donation and distribution hub. So I'll stop talking and I'll play this video for a couple of minutes if I may. Even if all these deliveries were still arriving but going directly to them, they'd still find the whole situation quite stressful because they'd have to work out what to do with them. Whereas here, we can do all the thinking for them 
and leave them just with the decision to place a request with us. Once they've done that, everything else we can handle. If we get overwhelmed with donations here, we can increase the number of sites we manage with very little work. This whole facility runs on 10 sheets of paper and one laptop computer. So it'd be really easy to, to expand this to cover other sites. And I think that's equally true of sites outside Cambridge. But what we're doing here, we're trying to learn lessons about how to establish this so that if other hospitals wanted to do a similar thing, then we could easily explain what we've done and show them how to recreate it. So that was a lovely example of, again, engineers looking at what the problem really was, coming up with a very cost-effective, very flexible solution and deploying it and making it available to anybody who wanted it. The second issue then was around bits of kit that either didn't exist or weren't available to the right people at the right time. So again, thinking back to that particularly uh, terrifying era where we, we in the UK thought we needed 30,000 ventilators and we had 8,000, there's the whole story of the ventilator challenge, uh, which we can talk about um, uh, another time, quite extraordinary achievement. But then another approach was to say, well, hang on, what if you could existing ventilators? What if you could have a ventilator that could be shared with more than one patient? So colleagues, uh, Duncan McFarlane and Ronan Daly and others, and Alan Thorne and a whole team of people worked together to say, can we make this work? And so they, they did manage to do it. And this is a short video that was put together by the BBC explaining what they did and why it was so important. When Covid first bit, many countries, including the UK, were worried they'd run out of hospital ventilators. They're the life-saving machines that breathe for you. A second Covid wave could still leave hospitals short. Which is where this new device comes in. It's one ventilator but for two people. You can see clearly here what makes this device unique. So imagine these bellows are human lungs. Now the one closest to me isn't going up very much at all. So that represents a smaller person with a smaller lung capacity. The far one is going up far more. That's a bigger person with a bigger lung capacity. So one ventilator able to cope with two very different people with very different needs. It's been designed by doctors from Royal Papworth Hospital and engineers from the University of Cambridge. This device allows us to instantaneously double the capacity of the ventilators in international humanitarian disaster situation or a mass casualty situation. We are fortunate that we've got enough ventilators for the other parts of the world in developing countries where they might struggle with resources as well as um, infections like COVID at the same time you could see the potential for a device like this uh, to be used to save lives. Well, we made it as simple as possible. We wanted it to be something that you could very quickly connect in an emergency situation or disconnect, as we're doing here. Now, all of the parts are things that you can source around the hospital or very easily around the country. Then we also made it very portable Working with Cambridge Design Partnership, we came up with ways of making it easy to move around and deliver to wherever it's wanted. We don't often get a chance to do something like this, where you have a, a, a real problem that's going to help people straight away, and you have the world's experts there to tell you what's needed right now. And of course, as with everyone, you just want to help. So everyone immediately focused on it and delivered. So there's a lovely example there of, again, working on what the problem really is and coming up with the most appropriate minimal cost uh, solution. So we also saw uh, internationally a lot of interest around coming up with technologies and supporting uh, activities far away from where we're currently located. And one nice example of this can be seen in people who are seeing the needs of countries, in this case, uh, Malawi, facing huge problems with, with uh, 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 limited resources to respond to them, to specifically on the issue of PPE. 
So there were some colleagues at the Institute, so James Moultrie and Lucia Corsini, who'd been working on the use of simple uh, digital or 3D printing technologies for in various different environments and saw the potential to develop PPE around this. And so a project was launched to support colleagues in Malawi to set up activities to deliver, to make PPE where it's needed, when it's needed, at the right quality, at the right cost. And this is an example of a whole load of things that were going on around the, the maker communities coming together to say we can address particular challenges being faced all around the world by distributing this knowledge to those who most need it. So what was particularly uh, um, pleasing to see was the result of all of this work was that the, these projects were recognised through one of the Royal Academy's special awards for pandemic service. And this was, again, something that, that we were very, very proud of because it showed that we'd managed to take stuff we already had and deploy it in the most useful way, as good engineers do. What's perhaps interesting is the fact that there were two awards made to Cambridge Engineering Department, the second one being for this initiative, um, driven uh, to a large extent by the Department of Chemical Engineering and Biotech, but also driven by the Whittle Laboratory. This open ventilator system initiative, again, very exciting how they managed to go at very, very short, tiny time period from basic concept through to fully functioning ventilator with the potential for global application. And then joining some dots up, they very quickly made this available to anybody through the open COVID pledge. But again, I must just add one other thing at this point. I've said all of these projects have been driven by bits of the university working with the NHS. But what's been fantastic from a Cambridge point of view is to also see the way in which the local community, in particular, one example of which is Cambridge Makespace, coming together to say, we want to do something. What's the thing we can do that is most useful in this context? And again, this, this ability to listen to what the problem really is and deliver the most appropriate solution. So I would urge, if you haven't looked into Cambridge Makespace, please do. And specifically, do look at that link at the bottom there. You can see these wonderful ways they got their community together to deliver some things that were absolutely makeable in that context and absolutely useful to the local healthcare system. Again, uh, I'm sure Makespace would love to be very happy to share more information on this. Okay, just to wrap things up then, uh, a few lessons we've learned from these three types of engineering activities. Uh, and again, apologies that these may seem very simple, but I think they're quite important. Number one is working with the healthcare system. The healthcare system is a complex system. And it's complicated and complex. And so the first thing we, we absolutely took away from this is there is no point engineers piling in trying to solve problems. First, understand. And I've watched... Uh, uh, Duncan McFarlane, who coordinated those hospital logistics projects. And this is an example of how it, it, demonstrating how it should be done. Don't go in there and tell them all the things you can do. Just go in there and listen. So we were very fortunate to be invited in to a number of, of Addenbrooke's based meetings just to listen to what they were talking about to try and see where we might be able to help rather than with the engineering department, we've got all this stuff. What do you want? Not that at all. It's all about listening and understanding. Secondly, recognising that most of these things are not solved by just a piece of technology, as uh, uh, some of our undergraduates get uh, beaten into them by me. Uh, technological knowledge uh, alone is necessary, but not sufficient. You can't just solve problems alone with technology. You've got to understand the context, the way it's going to be managed, the way it's going to be certified, the way it's going to be approved, the way it's going to be used by people um, uh, in very, very different contexts. So again, that was a key lesson to make sure we really reinforce those points. Secondly, speed. Again, that crystal clarity that those working in the healthcare sector have of we are here to improve patient outcomes. We're here to save lives. And that happens quickly. So if you go away saying I can come back in a few weeks time or a few months time or a few years time with a perfect answer, irrelevant. What is needed is something now that is good enough for this particular problem. The other issue is we, we saw our poor colleagues in the NHS suffering from massive, huge amounts of offers of help. And again, without any coordination, offers of help and good, smart engineers just trying to say, well, surely I can do something useful here. There's a coordination role which needs to be managed and needs to be clearly understood by those involved. But coordination is, is very hard to sort out in the middle of a crisis. Thirdly, and I put this in for a previous talk a few weeks ago, it's ever even more true now, this isn't over. 
And so we need to be taking these lessons on agility and resilience we learned over the last few, uh, few months and be deploying them right now to improve outcomes. The other thing is we have learned a lot over the last six months, but we mustn't forget that it was a very messy, difficult process and it's probably going to be messy and difficult again. We need to work out and understand how we got through that mess and difficulty to make sure we can do it better this time. But we've got to remember it wasn't just nice sound bites and elegant stories. It was a messy, difficult problems involving lots and lots of uncertainty. And to end, what are we doing next? Well, first of all, we now have uh, a strong platform for further collaboration. So the engineering department and the local hospital has been working together for years and colleagues such as John Clarkson, the engineering design center has for years been working with the hospital. What we found by these recent projects is that has, that has built upon those foundations and allowed us to build a very strong collaboration between the, the, the engineering department, the Institute of Manufacturing, and not just Addenbrooke's hospital, this is very key, the whole healthcare system. And there's something we can come back to on the Q&A about that. Secondly, we've seen that we can work very fast and we can do things in a very agile and lean way. We want to make sure that we go on deploying those new ways of work working and perhaps don't drift back to some of the slower, more uh, reflective ways that maybe aren't always the best thing to be doing. And thirdly, what we want to see is we have the great benefit of being in a university and having young people coming through hungry to learn about how to do things better. Well, we should be taking what we've learned over the last few months and incorporating that directly into education programs. So this stuff is directly improving the way in which engineers can deploy their skills and capabilities. So just to sum up, reminded you that this has been a very complex and difficult environment in which things have been happening very, very quickly with lots of uncertainty. We reviewed three types of projects there that explain different ways engineers can solve problems under extraordinary conditions highlighting three particular lessons that can be extracted from that. And maybe these next steps bit is about perhaps one bundle of pictures to sum it up. We have worked a lot with the hospital and that's been fantastic, but we also now much better appreciate it is a complex system that integrates a huge number of players beyond the hospitals to support the development of a resilient and responsive healthcare system. So that's, uh, that's enough of that, I think, for the moment. I'm now going to hand back to, well, first to say thank you very much for your attention and hand back to Kate for a Q&A session. Kate, over to you. Thanks ever so much, Tim. Some really inspiring stories there. We've got quite a lot of questions. I will endeavour to do my best to pose as many of them as I can. I think um, perhaps a good place to start is what did the IFM do that was different? That's a very good question. We've been pondering this um, and to a certain extent we can say we were just engineers doing what engineers should do. I think a particular advantage we had at the Institute is that we are very industrially engaged. We are there to, we have a slogan of we're here to manufacture a better world and the only way we can do that is be, by being actively engaged in the industrial ecosystem in every sector uh, going. And so we had that slight head start. We kind of understood things from a, a problem-based uh, perspective. We weren't there um, being all ivory tower, thinking of something brilliant and then seeing how could it be deployed. We were, we are naturally engaged with the users of solutions. And so I think that allowed us to have slightly easier conversations with colleagues in the NHS, notwithstanding the slight disadvantage we had, which is the word manufacturing in our title, because you know, why would somebody logically go from a hospital environment and say, you know, to deal with these problems, what we need to do is to go and talk to a manufacturing institute. Unless they're thinking about products, you might not make that connection. So again, it's the fact that we had a, a user-based focus and an ability to think about, we can deploy our, our capabilities in any environment and had experience of that. Plus some very helpful senior colleagues in the university and senior colleagues in, in the hospital trusts who were able to just make the introductions to make this happen. Thank you. Do you think that that was a unique situation or do you think that there's generic learning for universities? I think there's absolutely generic learnings as well. There's nothing that um, others, uh, so core engineering skills, the whole engineering design process is, is of course ubiquitous to all engineers. Um, I think perhaps the things, as I said, that we were able to do were a little different are based on how we work, but that doesn't mean that those 
uh, other universities can't do the same. And of course, m the vast majority of engineering departments in all cities and towns across the UK are engineers are embedded in their local community. Mm -hmm. I think it's just not being put off by the we're engineers with here to solve engineering problems. And so you end up talking to clinical engineers. Engineering solutions can be deployed much more widely. And perhaps it's just encouragement to say those conversations should be started wherever possible. Mm. Do you think that there are, or what, what has been fed back usefully to government? Oh, yeah, very good question. Um, the government's got quite a lot on its plate at the moment. And so we're very conscious as academics that one of our roles is to be a bit of institutional memory here and to actually observe what's going on, document it to make sure it's not forgotten, analyse it to see what worked, what didn't work, and make it available at the right time to the right people. Again, writing um, um, wonderfully structured, elegant academic papers based on all this is one output of a university. One might perhaps assume that's not going to necessarily be of great use to policymakers. So it's the fact that we also maintain these strong links with those involved in policy and, and are there to respond to questions they have. So you don't just send them in stuff saying, yeah, this is things you should learn for the future. That's no help at all. It's being available to have the right information packaged in the right way for when we're, we're called upon, we can respond. So I think the key bit is having those good links into government and to keep them live and be able to respond as needed. And so the work that Owen O'Sullivan and Carlos Lopez Gomez and others do is absolutely vital in this, maintaining those links at the appropriate level for our government. Great, thank you. Just lastly on that and turning kind of to the hospital really, was this situation specific to the Cambridge NHS Trust or could it happen elsewhere? So I think the, um, we were very lucky because there's a strong relationship between the Cambridge University Hospitals Trust and Royal Papworth Trust and the university at, at, a, at all levels, but particularly at a senior level. And so things could be facilitated very quickly. And so connections could be made um, that said, yep, you know, these aren't just some random academics who are banging on your door. You probably want to chat with them. And similarly, we could say, look, we don't want to waste their time. If, they, if, if this isn't appropriate, why are we doing this? So I think we benefited from that. But again, universities uh, that have a teaching hospital are in exactly the same situation all across the country. There's no difference there at all. So we're nothing unique there. We were very fortunate to have these, these two key contacts well, not just Roland Sinker, uh, a chief executive of, of CUA, of Cambridge University Hospital Trust, but also Ewan Cameron and Dan Northam Jones. And they fulfill this really important role that I think the academic literature says is called a boundary spanner. So they could see both worlds. They were very experienced in the clinical environment, but could also see the, the, the role that universities can play. And just were there to make the right introduction to the right people at the right time, and just to steer us through to make sure the right conversations happened. Again, we were much blessed by having them supporting us. Um, but those people exist in, in every hospital, I'm sure. It's just finding them and the work they do and connecting it to what's needed. So we, it was a, an unusual way in which it happens relatively smoothly. It might be harder elsewhere. It might be easier elsewhere, to be, to be fair. Mm. Um, the fact that Cambridge is quite a small place and the fact that the, the um, uh, tech community and the university and the broader society and the hospital are quite interconnected. I think that did help as well. Lots of people knew each other and could make that connection at, at all sorts of levels throughout the healthcare system. Great, thank you. I've got a question here um, about learning from overseas. Um, mm -hmm. Is that a factor in what we've learned from other countries' practices? I do remember, without making this too personal, I remember a colleague um saying very clearly before the, it really took off in the uk and when we still had people saying you know senior politicians i've just been into a hospital and i've been shaking hands with people i'm sure it's all fine type statements a colleague from italy saying you have to look at what happened in italy you have to this is coming to you you know what you what we're saying in the uk at that time was was we can argue whether it was right or wrong it, certain things were said that de-emphasized the seriousness what was happening in Italy was clearly very serious. They were imploring us to say, look at the lessons from there, reflect on them, do it better here. The trouble is, it's very hard to get a system to change. And mm -hmm. the speed at which it happened meant that by the time we realised, oh my goodness, we should be learning from that, it was perhaps a little late. That said, the speed at which clinical practice changed was phenomenal. 
So that idea that, you know, the, the rapid speed from initial um, identification of symptoms through to falling ill to being on a ventilator in the Wuhan first um, surge was quite short and the number of people on ventilators was very high. Italy, they started to learn and from Wuhan they learned as well. You don't need to do that. So the clinical practice transferred very quickly from overseas. That was very impressive to see. And that's a characteristic of the healthcare system. But on the policies to support and the, the management of delivery of PPE and the development of new technologies, I think there were some good learnings. There could have been an awful lot more. And of particular concern was this issue of almost the opposite of why aren't we building ventilators using this simple open source design over here? Surely that would solve the problem. And I remember being pointed to a website where someone had diligently catalogued 90 different open source ventilator projects and catalogued them by utility and likelihood of actually doing any good. And it starts off at the top with a one or two that you said, yeah, these are really good. They've got all the design sorted. They've got all the manufacturing bill of materials. The whole certification process has been done. But the vast majority were just ideas. And so people turning up saying, look, I saw this thing on a, on a YouTube that was happening in the Italian hospital. We should do that here. Just created noise. And suddenly people were going, well, hang on, that's a diff was it actually used? Under what circumstances was it used? How was it made? Are we talking about it helped one patient or a thousand patients? Mm. How did we do that? So it's I'm kind of answering it in two ways. In some ways, we could have learned much more. We also needed to be very careful about not just leaping on anything we saw elsewhere and saying we should do that here. It's back to this coordination point and filtering the information and curating the information and passing it to the right people at the right time. I've got a couple of questions here, um, actually, on the ventilator project. Um, it, one about cross infection. Is that how does the device prevent cross infection? Ah, so I'm very comfortable with my answer to this one here. I'm unable to answer any technical questions <laughs> on ventilators, ventilator technology. That is way above my pay grade. And it's, it, it would be wrong for me to attempt to answer that. I'm sure we can pick up that question with the research team then. Thank you. Um, a couple of questions here in terms of um, overcoming procurement procedures. So uh, particularly when enhancements or new innovations are made for use in hospital, how have we or have we worked with the hospital to overcome procurement procedures there? It's uh, a very good point. So I should just, uh, uh, for the audience's sake, uh, you know, that, that Kate uh, was very involved in trying to work out ways in which we could work with local manufacturing firms to increase the supply of PPE for local hospitals. And so we've, we've experienced these challenges uh, directly, haven't we, Kate? Indeed. Um, there's, there's a number of issues there. One is, there's a, an, again, it was interesting to observe this complex system problem. So there is a procurement the national, regional, and trust and individual clinic issues here. So it, it's it's not that there's one. My answer can't fit all of those, but it's important to recognise that they are all different things. For again, a tiny bit of context, and I'll try and answer the question. With central NHS supply, there is this sort of push model which says these are the things based on all the data we're receiving that you are going to need. In you know, normal circumstances, that I'm sure works pretty well when you've got massive uncertainties where suddenly there were shifts in demand and the announcements from Public Health England, which would say, uh, actually, you know, care homes don't need this level of PPE. Oh, wait, they do need this level of PPE for good reasons. Th there was all sorts of um, uh, turbulence then in the supply chain. Well, there may be enough available to do all these new things, but they're not channeled that way at the moment. So there's a whole coordination of distribution issue there. But your so specific question of procurement there's a pr local procurement functions, but there's then also, are you procuring an existing known thing from an existing known certified supplier versus are you procuring, are you getting a new supplier, which has also got to be dealt with in a hurry, or are you saying here's a new product that has never been used before, but someone in your hospital believes it could be very useful? What process does that go through? So there's a whole certification and CE marking and medical device approvals that can be accelerated and which were accelerated and continue to be in some cases during COVID. There's also a very practical issue that there, as we have at Addenbrooke, there is clinical engineering and innovation, a team of very smart engineers who are dealing with new things coming along going, is this what's needed? Can we test it to make sure it's useful in this environment here for this particular purpose? But that's a separate function from the procurement team who are more 
focus quite rightly on dealing with approved suppliers of existing known tested stuff. So I think one of the big issues is around how do you do the new things at speed at a national level with all the approvals and make sure that individual trusts have the flexibility to get a new thing and that their procurement systems can allow them to get those new things if it is safe and if it is cost effective and it's actually improving patient outcomes. So there's a whole bundle of issues around that we're, we're trying to look at at the moment, but it's incredibly complicated. I think the issue about cost effective that that links really nicely to another question here, which is um, who's going to pay? Are there issues to do with money and funding? Uh, uh, yes, <laughs> is the quick answer. <laughs> but uh, it's a really good point because when you're in a complete crisis situation, you know, cost no longer matters. These these patients will not survive if this thing does not arrive. Therefore, it doesn't for that period. It does not matter what it costs of your <laughs> quality cost time triangle. Cost one's suddenly relevant. But you can't keep that going. And then at what point do you switch and say, nope, now we're going for cost effective. So there's a whole, um, again, maybe uh, an offline conversation with colleagues who like to talk about this. How do you deal with that ability to rapidly source something and say, so if a manufacturing firm is told we need, you know, 50,000, 100,000 new gowns and you can make gowns, you've never made them before, but you're going to make them now. How does that firm work out how to cost them? They have no idea. Why would they know how to do that? Mm -hmm. The hospital will say, well, we normally, you know, get them for 50p or whatever, or a little more than that. But we know that you can't make it for that. And also, why would that firm start making these things if it's got no, without a guaranteed buyer at a suitable price to cover all its costs? So we noticed there was a kind of crisis period where you could throw, throw away, you could um, um, minimize the slowing down effect of costing and cost procedures. As you moved into sort of steady state crisis, that's a different situation to be in. And then you're back into business as usual, that's another situation that's different. And for suppliers, it's very tricky to make sure that, and for the NHS to make sure they're not either being overcharged for things or putting massive stress on the very companies who could solve their problem by being too focused on price. So I think it's complete panic crisis, a huge error bar has got to do something immediately by the end of today type stuff. There is, this is a rolling crisis, we need to deal with it through to how do we ensure that over the longer term we're getting what we need when we need um, in the right place. Yeah. Uh, just thinking about business as usual, are you worried that organisations are sliding back into business as usual? Uh, what about and not learning the lessons from what worked? So uh, Dick Elsie, uh, chief exec of the High Value Manufacturer Catapult, who also took on uh, the big consortium project, uh, Ventilator Challenge UK, to get um, Smiths and Penlon making, uh, rapidly increasing the number of ventilators they could make, made this point. He said, my goodness, during that ventilator challenge, so many good things happened. There's three quick examples. One was this sort of egoless behavior. People stopped, you know, saying, my name's got to be here. I've got, I'm, do you know who I am type stuff? And I, I'm in this role. I am the one who makes the decision. Thank you very much. All of that went out the window. And they started to be able to say, look, we can do these things. And actually the person who makes the decision should be the person who's got the knowledge. Doesn't matter who it is. They make the decision. If they know, they decide. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the use of um, new technologies. Again, and we have our colleague, Thomas Bonet, who's been looking at the way you can augment uh, how workers operate using technologies and work with Elisa Roth and Merkel Monks. Great stuff going on there. But for some companies it's been, yeah, that would be a nice to have. We can see this as maybe a thing in the future, although it's much more, uh, it's increasing rapidly. In the COVID crisis, suddenly those technologies became indispensable. You had a team of workers in one place, in one part of the country, and a team of workers in another. These people knew how to assemble ventilators. These people had never done it before. Suddenly, obviously, AR and VR and all these video technologies are brilliant for rapidly improving how people can do their jobs. It was fantastic. So it, we've kind of shown that you can do these things. And I think that, that's a, that has accelerated or will it continue to accelerate the adoption of digital technologies and all the sharing of documentation uh, that happened during that process when in the past it might have been, you know, exchange of PDF files or even posting things to each other to be certified. Suddenly you go, we didn't, we weren't able to do that. That was too slow. We had to do it digitally. So why don't we always do it digitally? Mm. So I think it's had, it, for those involved in industrial digitalization in the UK, the Made Smarter initiative, this has really shown that it's not just a nice to have, it's actually a, a really useful to have, and you can have it now. However, I think there was the issue of a common goal. 
that everybody was doing this and it was happening so fast because there was a single collective crisis that we all wanted solved. How do you maintain that when there isn't a crisis? And there's a, two points there. One is people are exhausted. You know, you can sprint for a while, but at some point you run out of puff. And if it's to get the ventilators done, fantastic, really good, outstanding achievement. You can't keep that pace up. And uh, secondly, do you want to keep that pace up? Because do you want to artificially create a burning platform? I mean, how do you do that? Why would you do that? As uh, examples we've seen from elsewhere, you know, things like Formula One in the world of motorsport more generally, they can have a compelling event. You know, the car must be on the starting grid on this day and it ideally should win, certainly not blow up. That's, you can do that in a very controlled, constrained way. But how do you do that? for the NHS? Would you want to do it? How do you get the best bits of this crisis management, totally focused environment in a way that doesn't just exhaust people and lead to a sense of, there must be a better way of doing this. Why is everything a crisis? Mm. I think it's a really, really good point. And we're thinking a lot about this at the moment, partly for our own sakes. I've got, I'm really mindful of time um, and I've got a couple of really um, fantastic questions that I just want to squeeze in. Um, one particularly about um, ventilators um, and that's how has the picture changed since March um, with uh, obviously the ventilator challenge and the uh, sharing innovation. Um, is there still a short way, a shortfall, you know, um, or will this be useful at a later stage? So I'm slightly out of my comfort zone here, but as I understand it, and please bear this in mind, this may not be exactly as it is, the number that were needed was predicted to be 30,000. That number was modified as the, the impact, the actual impact on the UK became clearer. So they didn't need 30,000, more like 14,000, and that's been done, and that's 14,000 additional ones. Um, so that's one issue there. They also again it's a it's another longer conversation but there were multiple projects launched around creating ventilators and there were, there were two three strategies but two key ones were by the government one scale up existing ventilator designs which is what the ventilator challenge uk ventilator challenge was about uh, the other one was to come up with new designs for ventilators so they did extraordinary work i mean dyson ttp all sorts of other people did amazing things to, to make rapidly manufacturable new designs in case they were needed as it turned out they weren't needed so it was very impressive to see how that happened but they weren't needed but all those designs including the open ventilator system initiative have the potential to be used elsewhere so that's now being deployed in africa thanks to a collaboration with a manufacturing companies that Africa called DeFi, working with prodrive in the uk so the technology was developed, it wasn't needed because clinical practice changed and the impact wasn't as severe as we thought. And then it also allowed that technology to be deployed to other environments where it could still be very valuable. Great, thank you. I think just one more question, a final question really, and that's, um, can you tell us more about how the IFM is approaching the coming year? Oh, <laughs> uh, with a sense of excitement. Uh, so one of the things is, uh, we're very clear that this is a chance for us to continue to do what we do anyway. So we do teaching, we do research, we do industrial engagement, and being forced to operate in a different way has forced us to innovate. And this is the same for many organisations. So for our you know, executive education programmes, if clients can't send their, their colleagues directly to Cambridge, well, we still need to do something. And so that seeing how our colleagues on the executive and professional development side have switched online with incredible speed and professionalism is really impressive and so now for those of us on the undergraduate and graduate teaching side we're learning from this so we're learning not just how you can switch to online when it's necessary but actually allowed us to develop a much better learning experience through the concept of blended learning it's not that you replace face to face with digital you become better at both that's one big thing that's going to happen and is happening right now at the ifm the other one is the way in which we collaborate and the you know, traditional view that you want everybody together in one building doing, you know, seeing each other, there's massive benefit and value to that. And that lovely picture I've got behind the Q&A logo there of the Institute for Manufacturing's court, courtyard. We're used to being in one place together and everything is about coming together. We've had to learn that we can't always do that, but we can still do a huge amount of what we want to do anyway, and more if we do it smart. But we're very, very conscious of the impact this has on people's working lives and it has been 
I think for everybody, I mean, perhaps for the whole, everybody on this call, is it's not been easy. And I think we need to be very, very careful as we go through this next period of, uh, we're talking about the next six months, that we're not just treating this as a rolling crisis. We're actually treating this as something we can manage and we can be sensible about, and we're very understanding of the pressure it puts people under, not least of which is having to learn new things and having to be available uh, via a screen rather than face-to-face. -face. So there's a whole lot of things I could talk about there. The main one I perhaps I'll end with is it's allowing us to be more innovative, but also ensuring that we understand the impact that has on our staff and our students. Thank you, Tim. Thank you all for joining us today and for posing such interesting questions for Tim. I'm really sorry that we are out of time now. This webinar will be available on demand, um, but if you'd like to know more about the IFM, please do get in touch or follow us on social media. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.